Okay, uh, welcome to our N3A seminar. Today, we are very pleased to have Professor Irene Tambora from Niels Bohr Institute. She will be talking about compact binary merger and slide share neutrino. Uh, over to you, Irene. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, hello to everyone. Um, please feel free to interrupt me also when uh, uh, during my talk. And um, what I'm going to tell you about is uh, 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 sterile neutrinos, which I was asked to talk about, but in the context of uh, compact binary mergers. And uh, um, this work, um, my talk will be based on uh, uh, this paper, which uh, um, was the master thesis project of Gardan Sir Gordanson, that was uh, um, a student at the Niels Bohr Institute. So a lot of the credit also goes to him. So in this talk, I will first talk about the, I will summarize the properties of uh, compact binary mergers, and then we will uh, go through neutrinos within this environment. And then uh, I will move forward on uh, the role of sterile neutrinos and their eventual production in the context of uh, compact binary mergers. And we will see how this uh, could change if we consider um, how the physics could change if we uh, then consider the evolution of the uh, merger in time and also uh, the dependence on the directionality of the mergers before to uh, conclude. So compact binary mergers are truly multi-messenger sources. And I, I like to show this figure, which really kind of summarizes all uh, the things uh, and all of the messengers that we get from these particles. So we have already seen uh, gravitational waves from uh, mergers in 2017. And these objects are also uh, sources of neutrinos. And in fact, we can produce neutrinos in the MEV energy range, uh, which are produced thermally, but also in the aftermath of the merger, then we produce neutrinos of the larger energies through particle acceleration. And uh, moreover, we also have electromagnetic emission uh, through the short gamma ray bars and then through the uh, kilonova, which comes from the radioactive decay of the heavy elements synthesized in the mergers. And uh, these objects could also be uh, sources of cosmic rays. So within the scale uh, of a uh, few hours, let's say, we can basically see all uh, sorts of messengers. Now, in, in many aspects, uh, compact binary mergers are similar to um, core collapse supernovae. And uh, I assume that many of you will be actually familiar with these uh, uh, objects. And the uh, mechanism behind those two uh, transients is, of course, different. In fact, in the context of compact binary mergers, we usually um, infer their origin to the uh, merger of two neutron stars or a neutron star and a black hole, while uh, core collapse supernovae are mainly originating from the collapse of stars that are at least eight times heavier than our sun. When it comes to uh, neutrino emission, uh, at least for the thermal uh, production, the properties of neutrinos are roughly uh, similar to each other. Although, as we will see, um, while uh, compact uh, uh, binary mergers are rich in antineutrinos, because we start from an environment which is uh, very proton rich, in the context of uh, core collapse supernovae, we have uh, an environment which instead is more rich in neutrinos than antineutrinos. And also, especially if we form a black hole as a compact object, we don't produce at the beginning uh, non-electron flavor neutrinos in the context of mergers, and then we can generate them through uh, flavor conversion. Now, when we focus specifically on neutrinos, uh, as I mentioned, we can produce two different uh, two neutrinos in two different energy ranges. And for the low energy neutrinos, uh, while, uh, for, in, for example, in the context of uh, uh, core collapse supernovae, we can see them from a burst of a supernova occurring in our galaxy or in galaxies uh, close by. In the context of uh, um, uh, compact binary mergers, we actually have a very poor detection chances. And this is uh, due to the fact that if a merger were to happen in our galaxy, then we could expect a number of events which would be similar to the one of a supernova. 
However, um, the, the chances or the rate of mergers locally is so low that we actually don't expect to see uh, any of these sources in um, low energy neutrinos. Yet we could be able to see high energy neutrinos coming from uh, the short gamma ray burst or, for example, um, uh, produced through particle acceleration uh, occurring in the kilonova ejecta. And similarly, we could also see high energy neutrinos in the context of a core collapse supernovae if uh, those should harbor a jet or if we consider um, shock powered interactions. So to put the things in, in context for uh, what concerns neutrinos, uh, here you see uh, the grand unified neutrino spectrum that uh, gathers all the information that we have uh, about the universe in neutrinos. And as I was mentioning, we can produce uh, neutrinos in the low energy uh, regime, in the MEV regime that you see are sitting here uh, together with the supernova neutrinos. And then uh, there are the uh, TV to PV neutrinos, which instead are sitting in this region here and uh, across the um, ice cube neutrinos that we actually uh, see. Now, before to move on to uh, low energy neutrinos, and then I will uh, just uh, focus on them, I just want to um, uh, discuss the context of uh, high energy neutrinos, which uh, um, uh, uh, probably you're wondering whether they have ever been detected or uh, since I mentioned that they actually uh, are detectable. And indeed, here you see um, the upper limits that were placed by uh, various neutrino telescopes for the 1708-17 uh, event. And you can see that the non-detection of neutrinos is actually consistent with the uh, theoretical predictions. And the reason is that we were actually expecting high energy neutrinos to be emitted during uh, the prompt phase of the short uh, gamma ray burst. However, the event was slightly off axis with respect to us, which implied that uh, actually the expected neutrino flux was below the sensitivity of existing neutrino telescopes. However, uh, in the future, especially if we uh, are going to observe on axis events, we have good detection, uh, good possibilities of detecting these neutrinos. We could also produce uh, neutrinos from internal shocks that propagate in the uh, kilonova ejecta. And a very um, special signature would occur if uh, a long-lived uh, magnetar would form uh, at the center as a compact object. And in this case, we would have particle acceleration in the atmosphere of the magnetar, which would lead to higher energy neutrinos that uh, together with the coincident detection with the gravitational waves it would be a smoking gun of the presence of a magnetars. So for the future, we have uh, favorable detection perspectives, especially within a multi-messenger uh, context. But now if we go to the uh, MEV regime instead, uh, here you see um, two snapshots of two simulations. So the one on the left is for neutron star of a neutron star merger remnant um, with a, a black hole as a compact object in the center. And on the right, you see um, a simulation of a core collapse supernova. <clears throat> and you see on the top panels, the luminosity as a function of time, and then the average energy as a function of time. And um, you can see that the luminosity is slightly larger in the context of uh, uh, compact binary mergers with respect to supernovae. But the luminosity of Nui and Nui bar, which are the solid and the dashed lines, are very similar uh, to each other for uh, the context of uh, core collapse supernovae. And you see here a larger difference for uh, neutron star merger remnants. Uh, as for the average energies, they are also a bit, uh, uh, they are kind of comparable uh, with respect to each other. And this a bit connects to what I was mentioning uh, before as well. So if we consider then uh, neutrinos of, in this energy range, uh, then within the uh, merger disk, they would um, uh, undergo interactions with the matter uh, background that then lead to uh, the well-known uh, MSW effects. But also as uh, it happens in the context of uh, um, core collapse supernovae, we also uh, have that the coherent forward scattering of neutrinos onto each other becomes relevant. And this happens 
because as you uh, might have guessed by the similarities of the uh, conditions between supernova and compact binary mergers, um, compact mergers are uh, among the richest sources in neutrinos in our universe together with supernova and also with the early universe. So while the uh, MSW related effects are very well understood, the uh, modeling and our understanding of the uh, role of neutrino-neutrino interactions in the flavor evolution of neutrinos is uh, still uh, not very well understood. And despite, of course, the fact that we are making a lot of progress. And here in particular, uh, one aspect that is becoming more and more crucial is that it's important the angle between the moment of the neutrinos that are colliding uh, with each other. So this becomes a nonlinear uh, phenomenon because of the feedback that the neutrino field gives on itself. And this is what it makes um, the whole problem uh, difficult to solve. So in addition to the standard uh, flavor oscillation phenomenology, the fact that the antineutrino uh, uh, are more abundant than the uh, electron neutrinos also gives rise to a richer phenomenology in this uh, context. And in fact, uh, um, here uh, you can see that we can uh, have what is called the, the matter neutrino resonance, which was uh, originally um, introduced by uh, Gail McLaughlin and collaborators. Um, and here you see uh, a plot from one of their papers where basically because we have um, an excess of antineutrinos with respect to neutrinos, then we um, have a resonance between uh, the uh, matter and the neutrino backgrounds. And uh, this leads uh, to uh, flavor conversions, which we, for example, don't find in the supernova context as we, when we don't have this kind of uh, excess. So besides finding uh, the general uh, uh, oscillation phenomena that we also have in supernova, then we need also to take care of these uh, extra effects. And one of the questions, of course, that we could ask is whether then neutrinos are affecting the uh, physics of the merger in some form. And um, what it seems we seem to uh, understand at the moment is that indeed we could uh, have an indirect impact of the role of neutrinos on the synthesis of the AV elements, as well as on the uh, cooling of the disk. And the reason like, that is uh, uh, substantiating this uh, statement is uh, um, that we uh, started to find in um, uh, early papers uh, together also with uh, Mengru Hu that uh, the conditions for um, uh, fast flavor conversions to develop in the core of the mergers are basically ubiquitous uh, all over the place in the context of uh, mergers. And so this means that the, the collective effects that are induced by neutrino-neutrino interactions are relevant everywhere because everywhere we have conditions that favor uh, the fact that those oscillations could be triggered. So we find uh, ELN crossings that are a condition to trigger uh, those oscillations. Yet in uh, a paper that then um, was uh, led by Ian Padilla guy, we find that uh, probably the uh, actual amount of flavor conversion is uh, going to be small. But this is uh, still a preliminary work because many effects um, uh, needed to be introduced in simulations. And so in a parametric work that um, was led by Oliver Just, we basically parameterized the role of flavor conversions in mergers by considering uh, a range of scenarios. And uh, what we found is that uh, um, in all cases, we can actually have an effect on uh, the nucleosynthesis by um, uh, having an enhancement of the production of uh, lanthanides, so of nuclei with atomic number larger than 130. And this, in principle, could have an effect of a factor of a few on the um, uh, kilonova emission light curve. Of course, uh, this was uh, uh, for a set of models, and then we needed to uh, de develop a better understanding by relying on a larger uh, set of models. But uh, um, still, we have indications that then the neutrinos could have an impact on uh, the kilonova emission. And uh, similarly, we also find an effect on the uh, cooling of rate of the uh, disk, uh, again, because of flavor conversions. 
So now, given all this uh, evidence that the neutrinos could actually play an important role in the context of uh, uh, mergers, then the question is whether we could have additional effects by you know, standard physics that is uh, linked to the neutrino sectors. And uh, in this uh, context, of course, um, sterile neutrinos are possible candidates. Um, we have at the moment uh, various anomalies that uh, don't seem to go away, and uh, some of them are linked to the old LSND and Minibun anomalies that uh, show a low energy excess in the data. And uh, then there is uh, also the reactor neutrino anomaly and the gallium anomaly that uh, show a uh, discrepancy in the normalization that is expected from fission reactors. And probably those are kind of solved and like associated to uh, uncertainties that we have in the nuclear physics. And uh, finally, from cosmology, we don't have a very clear indications that rule out uh, light sterile neutrinos. So while the situation is very confused and here uh, and confusing, and here you can see um, like a scan of the different energy ranges and the, like all possible probes that we can use for um, testing the existence of these particles, they keep coming back and we really are not able to rule them out. So the question is whether we can actually have an impact of these particles in the context of compact mergers. Now, this links a little bit to um, uh, all the work that has been done in the context of uh, supernovae instead, where um, light sterile neutrinos were brought up a long time ago as uh, one of the possibilities to actually make the um, uh, environment in the context of supernovae uh, neutron rich. Indeed, in uh, that case, uh, it was actually difficult to enable uh, an arc process, which would require a large amount of uh, uh, neutrons. And the, the introduction of sterile neutrinos would actually um, basically lower the value of the electron abundance. And this, therefore, was expected to be one of the possibilities that then would have eventually activated the, the production of the art process and therefore um, uh, led us to consider supernovae as also possible sources uh, of art process elements. And um, of course, this, uh, while more recent work has confirmed that this is the case, that if we have uh, uh, extra um, uh, sterile neutrinos, then we needed to take care of uh, the balance between the conversion of sterile neutrinos in electron or anti-electron uh, neutrino flavors. Then uh, in more recent work has actually shown that, that uh, it's very difficult, even if we consider sterile neutrinos, so to actually reach a value of the electron abundance that is uh, below uh, 0.5, um, because uh, simply um, we have strong alpha effects and uh, we have also a very proton-rich environment, yet we can modify the uh, electron abundance and therefore the nucleosynthesis of uh, the elements. And also we can modify uh, the wind um, velocity and the mass loss rate, as was shown in recent work also by uh, Xiong et al. So in the context of mergers, then uh, given uh, like this evidence that we have uh, from supernova, we can uh, try to see what happens. And this is uh, this work that we did was uh, really quite exploratory because uh, we didn't look, anyone looked uh, before at the physics of lighter sterile neutrinos in the context of mergers. And so we relied on um, uh, data from an hydrodynamical simulation of a black hole, uh, uh, of a, a neutron star merger with a black hole remnant of three um, uh, solar masses and a disk mass of 0.3 solar masses. And here you see some uh, snapshots of uh, the simulation of 25 uh, milliseconds. And uh, what we did was to select uh, some uh, directions that uh, would be kind of representative of what happens in between uh, those directions. So, so we have a direction that is uh, uh, along uh, the polar axis, a direction which is along the equator, and the two of them that instead are intermediate. Now, of course, you may wonder why like, we didn't choose something that is actually here, for example, close to the neutrino spheres. 
And the reason is that in the end, the physics, the phenomenology for the flavor conversions is actually very similar. And so we focused on the diversity that one can get in the phenomenology of the oscillations. But of course, um, if uh, we are going to be uh, to further investigate the implications on the astrophysics of the merger, then uh, this needs to be taken with the, um, uh, with the, we have to pay more attention to these effects. And so here you can see already from this plot that we have a large variation in the baryon vary density that we can pass from regions that are um, uh, with a large YE to regions that have a smaller YE. And also the abundance of particles is changing uh, quite a lot. And these uh, two uh, regions here are the two neutrino spheres of uh, Nui and Nui bar, just uh, uh, for having for orientation. So what we did was to focus on only two flavors so that would be one active flavor and one sterile flavor. And um, we solved the equation of motions. So in this case, then um, we actually uh, computed the collisional rate and found that it was uh, irrelevant in the region where the uh, sterile neutrinos are produced. And uh, then we also, since we were focusing only on the active, uh, active sterile conversions, we only have to take care of the vacuum term and the uh, matter term without the neutrino self-interactions. And so at some point, what would happen is that the, uh, we started to produce sterile neutrinos through uh, MSW resonances. And so here you see an example of the lambda, which is the matter potential felt by neutrinos as a function of the radius for the four different directions that I showed you before. And what you can see here just immediately is the uh, diversity that we find in the um, matter potential. And so we have then, and we should expect to have uh, a flavor um, a conversion physics, which is uh, highly dependent on uh, the directions. The regions that you see here in blue and in red are basically the energy bands where we expect to have resonances for neutrinos and for antineutrinos. And so here you can see some uh, curious things like in the, uh, along the, the polar axis, we find that we only have resonances for neutrinos, but we don't have any resonance for antineutrinos. And vice versa, in the, uh, along the equator, we mostly have resonances for antineutrinos, and we only have one resonance for neutrinos, which, however, is also very non-adiabatic, so we don't produce a lot of uh, sterile neutrinos here. And another feature also that we find is that uh, we could have uh, directions like those intermediate ones where we have multiple resonances. And like here, for example, for neutrinos, we have up to six resonances. Of course, this changes according to the direction, but this is very different from the supernova case where instead we expected to see uh, mostly one or two resonances, and there is no strong dependence on the direction um, the, uh, that along which we are uh, observing. Now, um, here you see uh, for a selected uh, mass and mixing angle uh, examples of the oscillation physics. And, and so here you see the probability, the survival probability of the electron neutrinos uh, or of the electron antineutrinos as a function of uh, the direction for the four selected uh, emission angles that we considered before. And this is a, um, an example of what I was mentioning before, that in the case of uh, uh, the polar, um, the direction along the polar region, we uh, basically mostly uh, like have conversions for electron flavors and none for the non-electron flavors, uh, sorry, for the, non, uh, for the electron antineutrinos. And for example, in this region here of 48 degrees, we have multiple MSW conversions uh, as a neutrino so propagate a larger radii. And while this is one energy, just for illustration, here you see uh, the, the energy distribution after all resonances along the four directions. And so the dashed lines are the um, uh, spectral energy distributions for the electron neutrinos and, uh, and antineutrinos in red. 
And after oscillations, then we have that these okra are the sterile neutrinos and the blue are the sterile antineutrinos. And so you can see that in the direction along the pole, we don't produce sterile antineutrinos, while we produce uh, more sterile antineutrinos than sterile neutrinos along the equatorial direction. And you can see also as we get some energy dependent features, which come uh, from the fact that given this funny shape that the matter potentials have, then not all energies uh, undergo uh, resonances. And uh, of course, we can then scan the parameter space in the mass and the mixing uh, of the sterile neutrinos along the different directions. And uh, as we increase uh, the angle or the mass, the adiabaticity of the resonances is also increasing, which leads to the production of more uh, sterile neutrinos. But you can also see that there are some regions here in the plane that are white. And those are white because of the uh, uh, lambda potential at which the resonance should uh, occur is actually larger than the value of the lambda that we find in the uh, merger. And so there are some regions of the parameter space for which resonances are actually not occurring uh, anymore. So, um, of course, then uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, um, dependence on of the physics, also on the mass and on the mixing angle of the sterile particles. But really, what we can see is that we have a strong effect that depends on the direction and which can uh, end towards effects on the nucleosynthesis as well as uh, the physics, the cooling rate of uh, the disk and the physics of the disk. And in fact, while I focused up to now only on the 25 millisecond uh, snapshot, here you see an example of the matter potential for three different times. So this is uh, 10 and then uh, 25 and 50. And so as uh, the time is uh, growing, of course, again, uh, these uh, bands here are the regions where we expect to see uh, resonances for neutrinos and antineutrinos. And as the um, uh, time uh, uh, of the merger increases, the uh, resonances become more and more adiabatic, which implies that we can produce more and more sterile particles. But for example, in this extreme case here of the 50 milliseconds, we only have resonances for antineutrinos and not for neutrinos because the uh, potential is uh, not going um, uh, from up uh, down. And so um, as uh, the uh, time is increasing, so as uh, the merger is evolving, then we expect that a larger region of the mass and the mixing of the sterile neutrino space will be affected by uh, the production of uh, sterile neutrinos and by uh, flavor conversions. So in terms of the physics that uh, um, uh, we have to expect then, if we are in the region along uh, near the pole, so at the 90 degrees uh, angle, then this is the region that is mostly affected by um, the neutrino uh, wind and by the uh, nucleosynthesis driven by the neutrino outflows. And so the production of sterile neutrinos would actually affect um, the nucleosynthesis. While uh, when we consider the production along uh, the equator of sterile neutrinos, then the reactions of the uh, electron flavors with the medium are those that affect the um, cooling rate of the disk. And by producing sterile neutrinos, which we can actually produce even like in the innermost regions of the disk, uh, uh, as you can see from these uh, first resonances here, then we should expect an impact on the cooling rate of the disk. So this brings me to my uh, conclusions. Uh, compact binary mergers are very rich uh, in neutrinos, and we just started to explore the impact of the neutrino physics on uh, the merger physics. So many things still have to be uh, understood. And uh, an additional complication could be uh, given by the possible presence of uh, sterile neutrinos, which um, could lead to the multiple MSW resonances that can produce eventually uh, sterile neutrinos. And the production of these particles would be strongly dependent on uh, the direction with a large production of uh, sterile neutrinos in the polar region and sterile antineutrinos in the equatorial region. 
Um, and this is, is true as uh, the uh, uh, black hole torus is evolving, but we produce more and more sterile particles as the time uh, increases. And this uh, could have implications both for the uh, outflows as well as for the uh, cooling di uh, di of the disk. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Irene, for this very nice talk. So maybe there are some questions. Uh, so. Uh, I can see one hand. Uh, Zidu Lin. Uh, Zidu Lin, can you please unmute yourself? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you. You read a uh, you you very nice talk. So, yeah, I have to admit that I, I don't know too much about the sterile neutrinos. So, maybe the question is kind of stupid. So, I see that the appearance of these sterile neutrinos are due to some something like the flavor conversion. It is a something like a conversion between the active and the sterile neutrinos. And also, you mentioned that uh, although we cannot observe the low energy neutrinos from the binary mergers, it's possible for us to observe some ex extremely high energy neutrinos uh, from the binary mergers. So I'm wondering if this kind of the production of the sterile neutrino can happen at extremely high energy, maybe for those extremely high energy neutrinos from the gamma ray burst. Is that also a possible place for us to see this kind of the mechanism producing the sterile neutrinos? Yeah, that's a good question. So the, uh, the, the sentence, the statement that they made about the non-detection of low energy neutrinos, of course, was considering the large statistics that we expect with respect to, for example, a supernova where we expected to see one million of neutrino events. But if we talk about a few neutrinos with low energies, probably we could be able to see something. It's not so clear, but maybe this is possible. Yet in this case, I was considering the uh, resonant production of uh, sterile neutrinos. So, so in order for them to be produced, we needed to have a resonance, which uh, an MSW resonance, which is uh, of course occurring if we have matter effects. In the context of uh, high energy neutrinos, usually we don't see this, uh, the effect of oscillations simply because those neutrinos are produced in regions where we don't have a lot of matter. But if the jet, for example, you should produce a jet and then the jet is choked, so it doesn't uh, make it true, then it's possible that the matter is large enough that actually neutrinos have non-trivial oscillations in the source before to leave. So those are the high energy neutrino ones. And in this case, of course, there might be situations where then you can produce sterile neutrinos. Most likely, those won't be the ones that, like, they will have uh, different uh, masses and mixing than the ones that I was mentioning, simply because you will be in a different energy range. So you will go in resonances in different regions. But it's possible that uh, this is uh, uh, something that could happen. Thank yes. You. Uh, are there more questions for Irene? Uh, I don't see one, but I have one uh, one question. So, so the shared neutrino production that we have talked about this is mostly through the MSW resonance. So, the collisional production rate is very small here. Yes. So, yeah, and mm -hmm. it's the same also in the context of supernovae for these masses of sterile neutrinos. If you consider more massive one, then the collisional production becomes relevant. And here it's even better because the densities are smaller for uh, compact binary mergers. And so uh, the impact of collisions is actually ah. smaller even, yeah. Yes, yes, because the collision rate scale says the density. Yes. Exactly, yes. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Are there any further questions from anyone? I don't see any hand. Then let's thank Irene again for this very wonderful talk. Okay, so thank you again and we will meet next week. Bye.